All right, so this is chapter 22, cardiac, specifically hypertension. And I am gonna share my screen with everybody and we'll pull up the PowerPoint and we will get started. This is a pretty straightforward um, lecture. Hypertension is pretty simple. So what are we going to learn? Well, we're gonna talk about the pathophys of hypertension. So what causes it? What are the risk factors? What happens when people get it? What are the signs and symptoms? What do we do to treat it? And what kind of different um, therapeutic interventions would we initiate for people with hypertension? Um, we're gonna talk about a hypertensive emergency, which I mentioned briefly in the previous lecture. Uh, we're gonna talk about complications that arise from sustained or untreated hypertension. And you know, we're gonna see what do we do as nurses to care for these patients and how do we know if what we did worked, right? Evaluating the effectiveness. So, you know, high blood pressure, hypertension, those two things mean the same thing. Um, but hypertension that is not treated is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, many different types. And it's also a risk factor for stroke. And when I say stroke, that means CVA. And CVA stands for cerebrovascular, we can call it an accident, which I think is too cute a name for something so serious. Some people call it an attack. It's where there's a vascular issue, but it's in the brain. So lack of blood flow. And then part of the brain doesn't get enough oxygenated blood, which causes neurological manifestations, okay? Um, people are walking around with hypertension and they don't know it because it is the silent killer. I can't say that to you guys enough. Um, honestly, people walk around with hypertension, they don't know it. And like I said in the previous lecture, if you're having a nosebleed, epistaxis, or headaches, chronic headaches, if that's because of high blood pressure, then you are dangerously close to a malevent like a stroke, all right? And again, this book uses the word normal for blood pressure. I hate the word normal. So I, use, I like filling in the word typical, you know, typical blood pressure. Less than 120 over 70, somewhere in that ballpark. Okay. When we talk about screening for hypertension, everybody should have at least an annual physical. And with that annual physical, you would hope that the patient's blood pressure is getting checked. Um, these screenings, I am actually going to change because basically everybody should have an annual blood pressure check, at least, at least an annual blood pressure check. And what is, when we say high blood pressure, hypertension, what is it? Again, we're measuring how much pressure, how hard is the heart working to pump that oxygenated blood through the arteries. How much pressure is on the walls of those arteries with every love dub, love dub, love dub. And, and how do we figure that out? Well, there are lots of factors that affect how much pressure is being exerted. And those factors are determined by things like cardiac output. In other words, is the heart particularly left ventricle healthy enough and strong enough to have the force needed to pump that blood. And then, does the patient have peripheral vascular resistance? In other words, the patient that has chronic edema. So you've got lower extremities that are very, very edematous, swollen. And all that fluid that's stuck in there puts pressure on the blood vessels. And so the heart has to work really hard to try to push that blood through where there's all that pressure. So peripheral vascular resistance is usually because of fluid retention. There are other things that can cause it, but that's the most common, okay? Vessel stretch, in other words, have the blood vessels been um, damaged in any way where they're not elastic enough to be able to withstand the pressure? In other words, it's like with uh, arteriosclerosis where the, the arteries start to get stiff and harden, you're gonna have higher blood pressure because it's harder for the heart to push the blood through stiff, hard arteries than it is through nice, soft, young, elastic arteries. 
blood viscosity. The word viscosity or viscous, okay, means thickness. Okay, if I say the patient had copious amounts of viscous secretions, thick, viscous means thick. How thick, how thin is the blood? And how do we determine that? That is hematocrit. The hematocrit, which is in a CBC, tells us, speaks to us about the thickness or thinness of blood. And then blood volume. How much blood do you have in your body? I will tell you this, that when you are pregnant, every pregnant woman experiences an increase in blood volume. And with that increase comes an increased risk of hypertension when you're pregnant. And that stops after you have the baby, right? But if you have a lot of volume in there, obviously there's more blood for the heart to try to pump. Make sense? So all of these things can affect blood pressure, right? Cause it to be higher. When we talk about types of hypertension, there are two, primary and secondary. With primary hypertension, we don't know. It's one of those idiopathic, which I love that word, but I hate it because basically idiopathic means, I don't know. Some people just have high blood pressure, okay? Secondary hypertension means that the blood pressure is high, so it's high secondary or due to another disease diagnosis. So for example, if you have, if you're pregnant and you have hypertension, that's pregnancy-induced hypertension, PIH, that's secondary. The hypertension is due to the pregnancy. If you have renal disease, you're gonna have hypertension. It's secondary because the, the hypertension is because of the renal disease, right? So secondary means that it's because of something else. Primary means there's nothing else wrong, your blood pressure's high, and I don't know why, right? At the end. Most people have primary hypertension. Okay, here it is, the silent killer. Dun, 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 dun. It is a silent killer because there are no symptoms. And I'm putting that in capital letters. You can have high blood pressure for a very long time and you would never know it unless someone checked your blood pressure because there are no symptoms. And when we talk about the things like the headache and the, and the nosebleeds, right? That means that it's been either not diagnosed, not treated, and now you're on your way to a stroke. Hopefully not, but so those symptoms are rare. Risk factors. How do we diagnose hypertension? Well, the first thing we look at is, do you fit the stereotype, the classic patient mold of who gets high blood pressure? Sometimes that is appropriate and sometimes it's not. You can have a very obese person and their blood pressure is within normal range. You can have a very thin healthy looking person and their blood pressure can be elevated, right? So signs and symptoms. Do they have kidney disease or heart disease? Those are definitely contributing factors to hypertension without a doubt. What medications is the patient on? There are medications that will have as a side effect hypertension. And then what are the patient's blood pressure readings? So when we use the word ambulatory, like ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, ambulatory means that the patient can kind of just walk in, right? So in other words, they, the doctor says, listen, your blood pressure is borderline high. Do me a favor, come back to the office in two weeks and just, you know, just pop in. You don't need an appointment. And let the nurse check your BP so we can see what it is. So that's ambulatory. And then home, patients will often use electronic blood pressure monitors and they're sold everywhere. I will tell you this, the wrist blood pressure monitors are generally not accurate. And the electronic ones with the cuff that goes on the arm are not the best either. Why? Because if they're not human. So when they're reading a blood pressure, you ever work with an electronic blood pressure cuff and it keeps re-inflating, it'll deflate and then it's like error and it'll re-inflate. The reason for that is that an electronic blood pressure monitor doesn't have ears like a human being. So it's trying to read the pressure while it's reading the heartbeat, the pulse, pushing the blood. And if there's any irregularity, it's not going to give you an accurate reading. 
and older people generally don't have a very perfectly normal or regular heart rate. So I do not like blood pressure cuffs that are electronic. The end. Risk factors, non-modifiable things you can't change, modifiable things that you can change. That's pretty straightforward. <clears throat> non-modifiable, if you have a family history, no guarantee you're gonna get it, but it certainly increases your risk, your age, your race, your ethnicity, and you know, your gender in here too men tend to have higher blood pressures than women but we are we are catching up to men with heart disease and hypertension okay um and then modifiable weight control i cannot talk about sodium enough to you and you will hear me say this over and over and over and over like i sound like a broken record and i don't care because salt kills more people, especially African Americans, right? Although the cops are trying to catch up with salt, I think, these days, but I don't know. But salt <laughs> is a problem. Salt is the devil. How much salt is too much salt? So if the patient says, Well, I don't use the salt shaker. Okay, that's good. But are you reading labels? For somebody that has known cardiovascular disease, 1500 milligrams, and I'm going to put this in here, limit sodium. So 1500 milligrams a day if they have disease, if disease is present. Oops, disease is present. And how about for you guys, if you're healthy, how much do you think? 2000 milligrams a day for a healthy person. And if you start reading labels, you are going to be in for a very big surprise. Because example, how many of you guys like those ramen noodles? Who eats them? I bet you do, right? The ramen noodles, you know, yeah, the hot water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How much sodium is in one of those? I don't know. You want me to go look? I can look at it. Yeah, you. yeah. You know what? Like yeah. Take a look. Milligrams or something? I already know. Yeah. Like a lot. Oh, it's a lot. It's like like at least 2,000 probably. So here's the thing. If you got you guys are all at home, go in your cabinet. Does anybody have a can of Campbell's soup? Is there a can of what? Or any kind of soup. Anybody Action. go grab a can of soup. Any can then. Yeah. What do you got, John A? Talk to me. I say it's only... It's oh, it's... 1,330. Okay, per serving, right? Yeah, yeah. per serving. Yeah. Okay. I got some. So right there, that's almost your whole day. And is that all you eat in, in 24 hours? No. No. Nope. <laughs> this barely fills you up. Just one serve. I know it does. And it's, it's, what you're doing is you're eating a chemical cocktail. That's what you're eating. A chemical cocktail that's loaded with salt. I thought and I'm telling you, you read the label on a can of soup, any can of soup, Campbell's or otherwise. Read the label on a can of vegetables, canned green beans, canned corn, canned peas. Oh, here we I don't go. Care. Campbell's tomato soup has 480 milligrams per half cup. Okay, so that's, and what is a serving size? Half cup. And how many servings in that container? Two and a half for this can. Okay, so two and a half, eat. so four, eight, ten, that's, so you got about 1,300, 1,200 there of sodium. Because I can tell you right now, when I'm hungry, I could eat a whole damn can of soup. That's yep. not a lot of food, right? Yep. You understand? Food is hidden. I mean, salt is hidden in the food that we eat. And we don't really notice it. You know, and God forbid you do use the salt shaker. And then people will say, I use sea salt. Good for you. Same amount of sodium and sea salt. Oh, it's the same. Oh, exactly oh, okay. the same. There is no difference. None. Read the label. Oh. Read the label. People act like it's so much different. Like people act like they should take apple cider vinegar every day and it's going to be a miracle and they're going to lose weight. 
<laughs> Even though it took them 10 years to gain that 40 pounds, but the apple cider vinegar is going to get rid of that weight and they won't even have to exercise or anything. And it's going to work in about a month or two. It's a miracle. Miracle. Don't you understand? It's 2020. There ain't no more miracles. Those days are gone. Okay. If it took you that long to gain weight, you're not going to lose it by sitting on your ass and eating the way you normally do. But I take a cup of apple cider vinegar every day. That's not going to do it. There's no quick fix. There's no quick remedy. There's not a pill. Cut belly fat today. Nope. You got to know it's a lie, right? And the same holds true with the foods that we eat. When you eat foods like you're on the go and you grab McDonald's or Burger King or whatever, read the label. Read the labels. Forget about the fat. I'm not even addressing the fat right now. Right now, I'm just addressing the salt. So it's enough to make you crazy. And, you know, read the label on the sea salt. It's got the same sodium content as good old fashioned, cheap Morton's iodized salt in that black container, right? Um, 2000 milligrams of sodium in a day is plenty. And if you are young and you are healthy and you'd like to stay healthy, take my advice, start now. When I got done nursing school, I mean, I was in my twenties. I had little kids. I stopped using salt. Now, do I eat McDonald's once in a while? Yeah, of course I do. Do I like some Doritos? Of course. Once in a while. Once in a while. Okay. Miss Miss Doodle Scoop says 890 milligrams. Uh, okay, so what's who's that say that again? I had a can of chicken noodle soup that says 890 milligrams. Per serving. Yeah. How many servings? Two and a half servings. Oh, nine, 1,800, and then a half of 890. Let's see, 450, 445. So 1,800, 445, 2,245, 2,245 milligrams. You already went over your limit. You already went over your limit. In <laughs> one can of chicken noodle, harmless. Oh, you don't feel good. You want some chicken noodle soup? Okay. So now as we had all that salt, now, what you got to do? Once, once you had all that salt, say it again, sweetie. I missed the end of what you said. I said, now that's the modifier, modifiable. You have all the salt in the diet. What? Right. You have, to, you have to decrease the salt, right? Decrease. Right. Okay. And physical activity. You better sweat. You better sweat and raise your heart rate three times a week at least. If you do not, I promise you, later on, you're gonna, you're gonna come back to me and I wish I had listened because when you are my age, let me tell you, 60 is a long way away for most of you. 60 is right around the corner for me, right? So you wanna make sure you take good care of yourself. If you take care of yourself now on the front end, it's gonna pay off at the back end, okay? And glucose control. You know, I'm gonna leave that there. My, my inclination was to remove it, but I will leave it because patients that develop diabetes because they don't watch how much sugar they take in. Diabetes, type two diabetes is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So your body is one unit that works together with all those like mini units, you know, cardiovascular system, the endocrine system, everything works together and everything's gotta be working right. If one thing is broken, it will affect a lot of others, okay? All right, lifestyle changes. Well, what are we gonna do? The first thing we do when somebody comes in and they have blood pressure that is high and we're concerned or borderline, the first thing we're gonna tell them is you gotta make some changes in your lifestyle. So we make these recommendations about diet, exercise and all that. And we'll say, all right, come back. And when they come back, typically, not always, but typically nothing has changed. And so they're right where they were a month ago. And so now we have to talk about what, well, we've got to do something, right? And so usually the next step is medication. The first step, and this is important to remember for initial drug therapy is, and I'm getting rid of all of these. It's not a thiazide-like diuretic, 
It is a thiazide diuretic, is usually the first line of defense, and that is hydrochlorothiazide, low dose. If we're gonna put somebody on a medication, that is usually the first med we will give. It's like a real, like a baby dose, like 12.5 milligrams. Let's see what this does. Right. And so we'll start there. And then where we go from there depends on, do they respond to that drug and that dose? Are they having any adverse effects with that drug? Are they, are they also in addition, like you can't think, well, now I'm taking a pill, I can eat whatever I want. No, you don't have to make those dietary modifications, right? All those things still apply. So we're gonna monitor and see, is it working, right? And as the disease progresses, as sadly it does, because people don't make changes, then we move on to, you know, like the heavier diuretics, ACE inhibitors, calcium channel blockers, all these other types of medications, um, because they, these medications carry with them other um, more significant side effect potential than that little hydrochlorothiazide does. So these are down the road. If it's not working, we may have to do something different. Um, and now we're getting rid of this. Don't worry about that. Complications. So I have high blood pressure and I haven't really done anything about it or I'm not taking my meds. Atherosclerosis, the arteries are getting beat up. And if you keep on beating somebody, they're going to get scarred, right? That's what happens to your arteries. They get scarred. And not only all the arteries in your body, but your coronary arteries. And if your coronary arteries get scarred with atherosclerosis, you are at risk for a heart attack. It can damage the valves in your heart, which can actually be a trigger for heart failure. You can wind up having a CDA, a stroke, and you will, not you might, I want you to hear this really well. People with hypertension will wind up with renal failure. Blood pressure must be controlled because you've got a system, it's called the portal system, at your kidneys that is comprised of really like a couple big arteries and veins and then many small ones that feed the kidneys. If your blood pressure is high, it's beaten up those vessels as well. And eventually your kidneys are just gonna tap out. We quit and then you'll be on dialysis. And eye damage, the blood vessels that feed your eyes, particularly the retina, which is kind of like the, the thing that sends the image to the brain. So when you look at something, you can see it and know what you're looking at. Those blood vessels get beat up. You can wind up blind. And nobody wants any of those things, right? I'm not gonna differentiate between hypertensive urgency and hypertensive emergency. And I'm also not gonna talk about, here's the thing, for RNs, we go into the IV um, pressors but we're not gonna talk about them here. Um, what I'm gonna say to you is, when a client comes in, you assess a client and you have a blood pressure, these numbers, okay, higher than 160 for systolic and higher than one, I'll even go with 110 for um, diastolic. Systolic blood pressure, higher, okay. There's even typos in these PowerPoints, you gotta love it, and grammar errors. So if the diastolic's higher than 110, and if the systolic is higher than 160, you are in an emergent situation. Guys, I'm gonna tell you to hold on for one second. I have a phone call from... All right, so hypertensive emergency. Blood pressure is super high. You are at risk for stroke. So it says risk for or progression of target organ dysfunction. In other words, kidney damage, retinal damage, right, CVA. Um, what do we have to do? We have to immediately, now, bring the blood pressure down. There, there's no waiting. If the patient's in a physician's office, um, we are looking at an oral medication called clonidine. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. But clonidine is an oral medication. It's also called catapress. And it will bring your blood pressure down right away. But here's the problem with that drug. You will have a rebound hypertension, hypertensive issue. In other words, you come in, your blood pressure is 160 over 110. I give you 0.2 milligrams of clonidine. 
I wait about 20 minutes, a half an hour, I check you again, and I have brought your blood pressure down to say 140 over 88. Feel a little better about that, right? You're not gonna have a stroke, but we need to do something else for this patient because if we just say, oh good, your blood pressure's down, go ahead, go home, bye, in about another hour and a half, because clonidine has a short life in the body, their blood pressure is going to rebound back up again. So clonidine will work for the immediate, but we must back it up with another longer acting treatment. Does that make sense? And that's an important um, distinction that you guys need to know. Okay. So clonidine, fast acting, drugs that go in quick and act quick, go out quick. That holds true for almost every fast acting drug out there, right? So I'm going to say it's in the system quick, but it's also out quick. So we've got to give them something else. Okay. Make sure you know that. Uh, there are your nursing diagnoses. Um, all drugs, let me just say this as a caveat, any medication that I give a patient that lowers their blood pressure can lower it too much. Right? So hypotension is always a potential side effect of any and every drug that lowers blood pressure. And so when you're like doing med templates or you're writing or looking up a med, you don't need to keep writing that over and over again because we know that it's understood. You know, if I give you a drug to lower your blood pressure, maybe it works too well. And maybe your blood pressure drops too low where you're symptomatic. Just remember, blood pressure is not too low unless the patient becomes symptomatic, they're dizzy, right, lightheaded, or if it's so low that they're not perfusing, where in other words, they're just not getting oxygenated blood. If their lips are turning blue, perioral cyanosis is usually a sign the blood pressure and heart rate are too low. So just remember those little points, okay? And uh, that's about it for hypertension. You've got a couple questions here at the end of the chapter. Uh, which I will look at before I post the slideshow. Does anybody have any questions about hypertension? Treatment of hypertension, diagnosis of hypertension, anything? I, I just have a, I don't have a question about hypertension. I just have a, a question. Okay, sure. Anything. When you, when you were talking about the, 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 the viscosity of blood, mm -hmm. what, what would it mean if... if um, if you have thick blood, like what, what does that mean? Okay. Like, is that dangerous? I guess. It is. Just because I know somebody was, um, somebody just went to the doctor and they told them that and I'm just concerned. Okay. So there's a disease that's called polycythemia vera. Poly means many. Cythemia means production of red blood cells or, or, or blood cells. Polycythemia vera. It's not very common, but it causes the body to make overproduce red blood cells. And what will happen is it'll, you'll just keep making these red blood cells and your blood, you'll watch the red blood cell count go up, the hemoglobin goes up and the hematocrit will start to climb. And the blood is thick. It's like motor oil, right? It's thick. And so we don't know what causes it. We believe it's autoimmune. We're not sure. Uh, it is rare, thank God. Um, and the treatment for it, if you really want to laugh, is bloodletting. In other words, that patient will go to a phlebotomist two to three times a week, and we just got to get rid of some of that extra blood. Okay. So we will, we will draw their blood two to three times a week just to keep the hematocrit and the hemoglobin back at a normal level. Otherwise, they're going to have a stroke. Yeah, or, I thought that they were going to have heart problems. Well, sure. Yeah, because the blood is too thick to get through the all the arteries and veins, right? It's very rare, though, thankfully. You don't see it often. Although I will tell you that I recently have seen commercials on television about treatment for PV, polycythemia vera. And I've never, I'm like, there really? Are there that many people now diagnosed? And I have not looked up, you know, recent statistics. So I cannot speak to you about that. But up in, the last time I read anything about it probably was a year or two ago, and it was still considered to be rare. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. It's a good question. Anybody else?
you know what will happen? We'll part ways and then you'll be like, oh, I should have asked blah, blah, blah. Just like when people go to the doctor. I'm going to ask the doctor this, this, and this. And if you don't write it down, you leave and go, damn it. Is there any homework for tonight? Is there any what? Homework? I, I, I don't give homework, right? The only, the only thing that you have to do is just keep doing your ATI, right? And the videos and the PowerPoints. So I'll get that PowerPoint up next. All right. And I'm going to get all the cardiac PowerPoints up today. And I also, I'm, I'm also helping out the night instructor for term three now. So I got to get the endocrine PowerPoints up too. So I hope I don't lose my voice. All right. Thank you, Miss Mary. You are welcome. Nobody has any other.